Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Buddhist Studies Podcast. I'm your host, uh, Kate Hartman. I'm director of Buddhist Studies Online and professor of religious studies at the University of Wyoming. I'm here today with our distinguished guest and the instructor of our next very auspiciously numbered course, BSO 108, Buddhism and Compassion, Dr. Stephen Jenkins. Stephen Jenkins is professor of religious studies at Humboldt State University. And um, thank you so much, Steve. Um, we're really glad to have you with us today. Well, it's nice to be here. Why don't we start by just getting to know you a little bit in terms of how it is that you came to study Buddhism? Oh, well, I was a very um, intensely uh, religious young person uh, inclined toward uh, mystical experience and I'd say even toward the idea that um, uh, you know growing up in a town that had I think 26 churches with less than uh, 5,000 residents um, seeing that um, love or compassion might be the ultimate uh, religious experience as the sort of core to things rather than arguing about who is God or what's ultimate reality, et cetera. So even before coming to Buddhist studies, I was very interested in love and compassion. And then uh, in the university, I had no idea about Buddhism at all until I went there. And that's part of what makes me feel responsible for what I do to this day, because the universities have been an immense force in the transmission of Buddhism to the West. Um, a huge proportion of Buddhists in the United States are college educated people. And I think that's because of the universities offering courses in Buddhist studies. So um, the Buddhist ideal of compassion uh, to me is one of the most extraordinary and precious ideas I've ever encountered in my life. And since then I've devoted my life to uh, doing research on it um, and finding over and over again that what I expected wasn't what I actually found in Buddhist texts. So it continued to be an exciting and uh, rich experience for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's always one sort of goal that we frame at BSO is that the kind of historical and academic study of these traditions, um, even though it may seem you know, not as relevant to folks who are maybe more interested in the practice side of things, actually insofar as encountering these traditions in their historical forms, um, challenges what you expect going into it, it can really sort of force you to think deeply about these central ideals. And so maybe we could have you say a bit more, um, you know, what did you expect going into Buddhist texts looking at this ideal of compassion? And, and why didn't it sort of accord to your initial assumptions? Uh, well, these are such continue to be such strong ideas in the modern transmission of Buddhism and in, even in academia that I'm um, I'm literally reluctant to uh, convey them in an offhand way in an interview. But mm -hmm. one of them uh, would be that uh, uh, selflessness, because in the West, selfless is a is a moral descriptor. So there was this automatic, intuitive. I think, response by Westerners to the idea that um, um, the idea of no self um, was fundamentally connected to selfless behavior. But the trick is, or the problem is that selfless is never used as a moral descriptor in Buddhist thought. And you'll be very hard pressed to find um, the, there's only one source and a very influential one where people refer to it, um, where Buddhists actually argue that because there is no self, one should be compassionate. Um, so that would be one. Um, a similar one is this idea that uh, everyone is interconnected. And I'm pretty confident that you will never find a Buddhist text ever anywhere that says that one should be compassionate because everyone is interconnected. And that was really fascinating to me. I'm a young person. I'm doing my dissertation at Harvard on compassion in Indian Buddhist, Buddhist texts. I completely expect to find these things. I do find them everywhere in modern discourse. And yet, um, I don't find them in the Buddhist texts when I start digging for them. Another one um, 
that I was kind of instrumental in changing was it was the normal idea at one point that bodhisattvas sacrifice their enlightenment um, for the sake of others. And that's actually completely false. I've even very recently heard it uh, uh, expressed again by a, a well-trained Harvard graduate uh, to a class of Buddhist studies students. Um, bodhisattvas achieve enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings. It would be an incredible irony. But here's this will give you some idea of um, how these kinds of uh, problems and in interpretation function. Um, I came across another scholar who also noticed this and couldn't figure it out. And he particularly, he noticed he was actually hearing it from uh, Chinese scholars. And eventually what he discovered was the Chinese scholars who were uh, repeating this idea, and of course, when you hear it from an Asian, you feel like you're getting it right from the horse's mouth, right from the heart of the tradition. Um, but what he found was that only scholars who read Western books on Buddhism actually presented these ideas. And that's a concept I often use in my classes called the pizza effect. Yes, where I was just thinking of, of that. Power, because of the power of our expectations, um, uh, traditional cultures respond in a way that uh, meet those expectations and you, you get a feedback loop. Western scholars start to present it in texts. They start reading our texts, feeding it back as uh, mm -hmm. As you know from the work of this, uh, the website, that's especially true in the yoga traditions. It's a great example there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for those of you listening and saying, the pizza effect, what's that? Um, it refers to this idea, and um, you know, some people debate this, but um, we often think of pizza as having been invented in Italy, but according to some, and I'm not a historian of food, uh, it seems to be invented in the Italian-American diaspora community, and then goes back to Italy where Italians start to think that pizza comes from Italy. And again, you know, Italians uh, don't, <laughs> you know, uh, hate to tweet us, um, but our stories about the origins of things can change. And in some ways, the story that gets invented somewhere else can go back to the original place. And you have this interesting feedback loop that obscures the kind of actual historical origins of something. And it's interesting that you say that this discourse of what compassion is that's become so dominant in the modern context threatens to obscure the way that um, early Buddhist texts talk about this. And right. so maybe we can go through, um, like you mentioned a couple of different ideas there that I think we can dig into each of them um, a bit more. Um, so I'm intrigued by this notion of, yeah, you're talking about selflessness as a moral descriptor, right? We say um, in English, oh, you know, I really like Susan. She's so selfless. You know, she's always helping other people. So she's so selfless. Um, mm. But you're saying that that's not something that you find when reading these Buddhist texts. No, it's, uh, I've actually even read um, scholars working on this who describe how in Buddhism you could become selfless. You cannot become selfless in Buddhism because you don't have a self in the first place. Uh -huh. You might realize that you don't have a self, but you don't become more and more selfless. Um, and so selfless will be a descriptor of all behaviors, you might say. So it can't be a unique descriptor of behavior that's compassionate. Um, mm -hmm. And the achievement of uh, realizing no self realizing that you're an incessantly self-renewing process um, is um, related to, uh, un it undermines attachment and takes away a lot of negative factors, but it isn't sufficient. And this is very explicit in Buddhist tradition as a, as a type of error that can be made. It isn't sufficient to, as a generator of compassion. Mm -hmm. For one thing, it's really important to remember that the vast majority of Buddhists were never meditators or philosophers, and that includes monks. Mm -hmm. And that we still see, though, that compassion is a civilizational value. And you see truck drivers who won't smack a fly in their truck in Tibet. Um, and even the rough guys will show you their scars and knife fights will still even manifest that type of value. Um, so how do grandmas 
create a civilization that has based in those values. And do we really think that the average Buddhist worldwide understood self and no self or emptiness or cosmic interconnection? And that was the root of their compassion. We, we're still arguing as scholars about what those things really mean in the West, much less have many people realize them. Mm -hmm. So there has to be other things and the other things are really exciting. They're really fascinating, and they create a beautiful vision of uh, both self-flourishing and cultural flourishing based on compassion in ways that are really compelling and tend to be missed because Westerners thinking that Buddhism is philosophy and meditation think if they just meditate or they just sort of try to realize these uh, esoteric uh, philosophical ideas that that will make them compassionate. Mm -hmm. And Yeah, it's a really, um, you know, if we think that you have to understand no self or you have to do a lot of meditation to be compassionate, uh, that's a really bad situation for all of us because um, yes. it's really difficult to understand no self. I don't think I do. And um, yeah, that you, you, if, you know, our temporal priority is given to philosophy and abstract meditation, and then as a result, you get compassion then I think you're right to say that, well, how do we explain the fact that compassion is this um, virtue mm. upheld by lots of Buddhist societies in lots of different ways, even as we know, um, probably 95% of Buddhists never meditated a day in their lives. Right. And the rigorous uh, practitioner as well, compassion is the motivation for achieving those higher realizations. And compassion is the thing that grounds these... Uh, the most profound direct realizations of emptiness in a way um, that, uh, especially in terms of the bodhisattva ideal, keeps us engaged with the suffering of the world. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, in the uh, Dashabhumika Sutra, which is the Sutra of the Ten Stages of a Bodhisattva, when a Bodhisattva directly realizes emptiness, um, the text actually warns if it were not for their former vows, which means their, their compassion vows, their vows of commitment to save all sentient beings, and if not for the intervention of the Buddhas, that all compassionate activity for sentient beings would cease. So these two wings, the compassion wing and the emptiness wing, have to both balance each other. And um, compassion needs the realization of emptiness to empower its ability to relieve suffering. And it, uh, the compassion side is necessary that we don't um, engage in meditation in a way that's a kind of spiritual escapism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think anyone who's spent time, you know, reading about Buddhism or around um, Buddhist beginner communities uh, will have someone ask them, well, you know, if, you know, nothing exists ultimately, or people don't have inherently existing selves, or if everything's interdependent, then doesn't that mean that um, nothing exists and nothing really matters? Um, you know, that's a classic question that I get, you know, in every course on uh, Buddhism that I've ever taught. And sadly, and when Western scholars respond to that question, usually they just try to, they start from emptiness and try to work out from there or start from no self. And the thing is that the tradition has actually directly addressed those questions. They knew those were problematic. Um, and even the perfection of wisdom says, this is the most profound and difficult thing for a bodhisattva to understand that they should have compassion for sentient beings that ultimately don't exist. So they know this problem. And in the course I'm offering, we're gonna to try to see how they directly, explicitly respond to the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think part of um, because I will freely admit to, to using this kind of idea in a heuristic that um, emptiness and compassion kind of imply each other. Um, and, you know, often that comes from, you know, I'm limited in the amount of readings I can assign to students. We read um, the Buddhist First Turning the Wheel Sutta. And, you know, you end with this sort of invocation of um, impermanence as the thing that Kondana realizes that the Buddha says, you got it. And, you know, I'll sometimes, you know, make the bold claim that, you know, everything flows from this idea of impermanence. Mm -hmm. And I think that that can be useful in certain kinds of ways, but it also, I think, as you're pointing to, obscures things. And um, if we take, 
this sort of prioritization of these abstract ideas about interdependence and interconnection, no self, too seriously, we can miss reading the very texts that delve into these kinds of things. Right. And if you've ever lived in Buddhist contexts, you know, like I've lived in monasteries in Kathmandu, and you know, the places like a, there's like thunderous masses of riotous little kids there as monks, you know, learning to chant Buddhist texts and things. So how do you train them up? You can't presume that, you know, you're going to raise children or cultivate teenagers in the monastery, those kinds of people. Um, and even all the people maybe who are not so equipped to be philosophical or don't have the funds in, in traditional Tibet, you had to be a fairly wealthy monk to be able to engage in the debate court and have the time for meditation. Um, what do you offer those people? How do you ground their ethics if it's not in those types of uh, sort of higher level thinking? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and, and that, that compassion really serves as that kind of grounding function, um, both mm -hmm. for those you know young monks who haven't done the philosophy, may never do the philosophy, um, and also for those who are trying to understand advanced concepts like emptiness and face this danger that, as you say, Buddhist texts are very aware of, that you can spin out into nihilism. Um, if you keep this grounding of compassion, it'll kind of keep you oriented towards um, relieving the sufferings of others. Um, which, you know, I'm supplying my own little definition of compassion there, but how, how, how do you think about, you know, what compassion is? And perhaps that's, you know, a very broad question. <laughs> it is a broad question. Um, so the listeners will forgive me. I'll just try to, you know, find a, something to say that probably won't be any comprehensive, uh, I think, response would be implicitly false. But one of the things that fascinates me about compassion when you ask like what it is, is that the meditation, uh, the cultivations of uh, compassion are generally expansion practices. They start from uh, self love, which are like arguably the two worst things in Buddhism, the idea of a self and the attachment to that self. And um, what they do is they try to break down the barriers between that fundamental attachment that all life forms have to their form and to persist in that form and replicate that form um, to expand it to include all sentient beings and they do it systematically you can do it spatially they'll start from your space to the room to your campus to your you know your town to your state to the united states etc or they can do it relationally you know to people that you're very very intimate with to people that you are indifferent toward to people who are actually your enemies. So they're trying to break down the barrier. So they take the very thing, that sort of passion that drives the wheel of samsara um, and turn it into a, the great compassion, a passion that embraces all sentient beings. Um, another place you can kind of see that is with the, the, the most prominent, you might say, metaphor or model for that Passion is a mother's attachment to her only child. So right at, you know, fundamental, you know, all biological forms attached to their replicants, you know, to our producing our replacements. Um, life is no respecter of individuals, you know. We, um, that, that's about as deep an attachment, as fundamental a human attachment as you can get. But they say if we had that for all sentient beings, then... Um, we would be, we would achieve another level of compassion. Um, I'm reminded of um, reading um, the, you know, discourse on loving kindness uh, that I have students uh, read in my class, and they'll ask, like, you know, do I have to meditate on loving kindness for, like, you know, the worst person I can imagine, you know, Hitler or whatnot? And I said, no, <laughs> don't, don't start there. Um, if you're just trying to see beings as just abstract beings, and I'll pick the one that you know is is most alien from me, and I'll try to be compassionate towards them, you're just going to not succeed. Um, but if you start with something that you kind of already feel naturally, you build on well, we already have some self-regard, or you know we know this like love for our loved ones, um, 
and then you build out from that. You don't have to create from nothing. You don't have to have compassion for someone that you hate right off the outset. You can start with something you do have, and once you expand that, then maybe eventually it can expand to all sorts of beings, even the ones that seem most hateful to us. Yes, and that can also be, I mean, especially with um, Tonglen. Uh, I've seen many times that uh, come to that part of the practice where you extend that to enemies. And, you know, there you always have to remember that many of your um, students have been profoundly harmed by others, maybe sexually abused and things like that. And um, people will can be shattered by trying to enter into that space. You have to be very careful with it. But another thing I'd really love to, I like and wanted to highlight from what you just said is that the Tibetan Lojong practices, which are, they call them mind training, it's, they're probably the most elaborated uh, compassion practices, you might say. Um, in those practices, uh, it's very important that you are meditating on concrete persons that when you start with suffering you think about your own actual uh, physical and uh, psychological suffering and really engage it that when you um, think about you know self-love something you're trying to expand you actually uh, fully inhabit that and that you direct it toward actual beings Um, another kind of challenge i would put out in terms of the way people are talking about uh, compassion these days is that they think that the way to avoid burnout and things like that is to depersonalize it. That this is sort of like a, a, an impersonal kind of compassion. Again, that there are no selves out there, but the tradition actually emphatically states that when you do these spatial practices, even where you're trying to, it says it'll uh, concretely refer you back to the fact they're talking about the people in those spaces. And then when you actually do the meditations, you concretely meditate on specific people. So I don't know. I think that the depersonalization of it is not, is not helpful. And we always have to remember that our ethics and our compassion is about, it's about you and me. It's about us human beings. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the reference I think of here um, actually comes from Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov. And mm. uh, there's a scene in which um, an elderly woman goes to this uh, father, Zosima, this, this priest, um, and says, you know, I love all beings. Um, sometimes I feel like I have so much love for all of them that my heart will just burst. Uh, but then I meet an actual individual human being. <laughs> and within 10 minutes, everything from the way he, he, he chews to the state of his fingernails to the, his sort of smell, like, it just makes me hate him so much. How can I love human beings generally, but hate individual human beings so much? And it kind of is an opening question that sets the scene for the rest of the novel, which is to say that, you know, any compassion worth its salt has to be for individuals, you know, for Mm. better or for worse. Um, Anything that's sort of too abstracted is just going to fall apart, uh, you know, when you actually encounter humans in all of their messy glory yes Um, yes and um even i think that even goes to the people we absolutely despise and these days there's such intense polarization and such intense intolerance even by uh, you know people who are liberal minded or think that they're the tolerant ones um they, they would almost invite that challenge um, there's this beautiful idea of thank you, precious teacher, you know, as uh, thinking of, well, let's just, I'll suggest that perhaps there might be people who take Trump or Biden, I'll, let's throw them both in as some sort of uh, almost demonic entities. But um, another way of looking at them as, as, as uh, challenges and opportunities to actually expand our capacity for compassion. Mm-hmm. So Shanti Deva will say, uh, you know, thank you, precious teacher. The person who flips you the bird in road rage, thank you, precious teacher. Every time you have that opportunity that rises up where you can have that negative response, thank you, precious teacher. It's a beautiful teaching. You definitely don't see a lot of that on Twitter these days. <laughs> no. um, as someone who unfortunately does spend um, quite a bit of time on Twitter, um, Many opportunities for patience 
uh, but not a lot of um, <laughs> opportunities that we take up. And, and that gets to another question, so I'll put a pin in that for this question of kind of political action for later, because I do think, um, and you'll, you'll, you talk about this in uh, BSO 108, the course, that you know, what does compassion have to do in situations of um, potential violent harm, right? So um, does compassion imply you know, just thank you, precious teacher, to everyone, and then you just disengage, or um, is there some other way forward? And, and so we'll talk about that, because th that's a really interesting set of questions. Um, the one idea you mentioned earlier that I did want to pick up on, because I do think that this is, a, this is really kind of a widespread idea, is often um, people will talk about bodhisattvas as, oh, these beings are so great, they're so selfless, uh, that they actually give up their own enlightenment for the sake of helping other beings. Right. And that this is um, indeed a model of compassion that suggests that what compassion is, is sacrificing the things that you want for the good of other people. Um, so I think you framed that as one of these kind of perhaps misconceptions that a lot of people have. Right. So that going back to the pizza effect, um, and to just elaborate that a little, if you think about 6 million Americans going to Italy every year, willing to spend good money on American style pizza, but which they regard as sort of the original authentic Italian pizza, you could be damn sure that every restaurant in Italy is going to start producing pizzas that mimic American ideas of pizza. And then Americans see those pizzas and they come back to the States and they start pizzerias that are like these thin crust pizzerias and whatnot that are supposed to be the, uh, basically they're Italian attempts to imitate things that like Sicilian grandmas in Chicago and stuff created in the United States. So, um, you know, here again, um, you have this idea um, that should remind everyone from our side of this uh, world, our, our, our greatest cultural legacies of the self-sacrificing servant in the uh, um, Western traditions, the suffering servant of the Old Testament. And um, of course, Jesus Christ, where you might say the one who suffers the most is the holiest one. The one who absolutely sacrifices most fundamentally is the sort of highest spiritual ideal. So it's no surprise that we would project that on the Bodhisattva idea. And of course, there's things also that would make you reasonably um, connect those two ideas. And there's a story of the Buddha in a past life where he sacrifices himself to a hungry tigress, shows he won't eat her cubs. The thing is, when you read that story, it's the Buddha says before he offers himself, today is a day of great opportunity. And after he sacrifices himself to the hungry tigers, which is, of course, an extraordinarily exceptional thing, and, and who should be able to do that is very intimate with the current problem of, of self-immolations in Tibet. Um, after he uh, does this great sacrifice, the giant pinball machine of karma just shakes and rocks and just like massively racks up a score where you can see that the Buddha has made this incredible level of spiritual progress and empowerment. So even in that case, even in the cases where bodhisattvas sacrifice their heads, like Maitreya is famous for this in the past life story, people try to stop him. And he says, you are interfering with my spiritual progress. Mm -hmm. So um, generally speaking, uh, even the most extreme examples, um, uh, bodhisattvas, um, achieve great spiritual progress. Sometimes you have to realize that we're talking about a multiple life perspective to really see how the idea is framed. Um, but uh, also in general, um, the generous attain wealth. If you offer clothes, you'll never be without clothes. Um, if you offer food, you'll never be hungry. There are all these ideas that um, uh, giving enriches you. Uh, and I think uh, from the, and at first that sounds very magical, 
But if you think about uh, a lot of the scientific studies now about giving and things like that, we find that people are actually happier. That if you think about a culture of giving, that actually you create a more prosperous economy where there's general prosperity and empowerment. Um, so yeah, it, it isn't quite as uh, uh, difficult to understand as it might seem. And technically, for a bodhisattva to say, I won't attain enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings would be like a doctor saying, I won't complete my medical training until I cure cancer. Um, the enlightenment is precisely what you need to relieve the suffering of all sentient beings. Um, there are extremely rare cases. And this, this is the funny thing that the idea was so dominant throughout all the sort of Taurus test books and even in Dharma teaching centers when you couldn't find that anywhere in a Buddhist text. But there are some very rare exceptions. Uh, in Nyingmapa Yigcha, for instance, there's a shepherd-like bodhisattva who shepherds everybody else into salvation, before, like his flock, before he himself enters. And uh, Sankapa actually notices this. Somebody challenges him about this idea. He says, don't worry about it. Bodhisattvas visualize all kinds of intentions um, that are meant to sort of uh, be ways of generating compassion, of conceiving their service to others. But it doesn't mean that that's what they actually do. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just commonsensical in the end, to tell you the truth, that um, bodhisattvas do not sacrifice their their enlightenment. Um, there is more, if you want to push further on this, we can go into the relationship to the idea of attaining nirvana or not, which is another tricky and interesting question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is, I think, something that um, is under discussed in a lot of um, writing about Buddhism generally, is that when we talk about enlightenment, and nirvana and awakening, there's actually so many sort of levels or ways of conceptualizing it. It's a, it's a complex sort of set of related states and ideas in the Buddhist text. And so, you know, do bodhisattvas attain nirvana or not? You know, it's, it's actually a really sort of complicated <laughs> question. Yes. But certainly the sense of um, attaining awakening for the sake of all beings um, doesn't necessarily imply that there's self-denial there. And broadly speaking, this notion, you know, we could say, you know, path A is uh, you should be compassionate even though it's going to be painful to you. Um, you're just really good because you're willing to sort of do this painful thing for the sake of others. Or path B is um, you should be compassionate because it's good for you. It's You should be compassionate because it's nice. It's joyful to be compassionate. And um, it benefits you and others and, you know, how amazing and and you can just think like it's kind of more attractive to go down path b yeah there's a productive paradox there that can be very confusing which is that the more dedicated i am to the benefit of others the more i bless myself mm -hmm. and that can that can become well it actually has been very confusing because you will see passages um uh, shantideva nasanga actually four centuries before him said, you know, the person who pursues their own self-interest actually pursues unhappiness without realizing it. The person who pursues it, the happiness of others um, receives success, blessings, etc. It's funny, they never notice the second part, that mm -hmm. in pursuing the benefit of others, you receive all these blessings and benefits, that it will transform your family, that it will transform your psychology, that your business, your country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm reminded of a conversation I recently had with um, Lena Versary, who just uh, graduated from Harvard, um, also in, so for those listening, uh, Steve and I are actually in the same sort of teaching lineage, uh, insofar as we both uh, studied under Charles Halsey and got our PhDs at Harvard. Um, so Lena is another member of the extended academic family. And uh, she wrote her dissertation, Ethnography of uh, this particular Buddhist group that emphasizes asceticism. And one of the things that she was struck by was over and over again, her informant said, um, I do asceticism because it is a pleasure. Um, and emphasize mm -hmm. that um, they're not giving anything up. It's actually a joy to practice asceticism. And the way that it is framed is not as a lack of the things that you want, but as actually a pleasure. <laughs> and certainly, in order to make that work, you kind of reconceptualize mm 
um, you know, where your time of interest starts and stops. But her, her informants would go to bat and say, you know, moment by moment, this is a pleasure. Why would we do this if this was painful? And, you know, she was so struck because I think in a parallel way, um, the way asceticism is often talked about is just, you know, of giving stuff up and depriving yourself. And that that, you know, it wasn't how her um, informants conceptualized it at all. Right. The um, meditation theory is actually pretty explicit that uh, the more deeply rigorous you are in your meditation, you achieve states of ecstatic bliss that can even be distracting. I remember always when I would bring my students down, I'd bring as many as 150 or so down to a city of 10,000 Buddhas, and they always they sleep sitting up, they, they're celibate, et cetera, and students couldn't imagine that this would actually be a more pleasant. And in terms of compassion practice, um, this is something you're supposed to bless your health that removes all the negative emotions in your system. I mean, once it's painful to have that attitude towards uh, the right wing or the left wing, wherever you're finding yourself. Anger um, is toxic for the angry in the same sense that compassion blesses the compassionate. Um, so um, compassion brings beauty into your life. It has an almost, well, not almost, but a yogic power to overcome revulsion. And if you remember the two, there are three fundamental things at the core of the wheel of suffering. One is ignorance, one is attraction, and one is revulsion. What are we revolted by? Revulsion to suffering, revulsion to death. Compassion moves towards suffering. It's almost like in a dream where you're like being chased by a monster or something. A good psychologist will just tell you, turn towards the monster, and they're instantly disempowered. Uh, a lot of times people have terrible recurrent dreams instantly end them simply by turning toward it and compassion turns towards suffering it turns toward the thing that we're constantly fleeing from in our lives and that is an incredible psychological empowerment and a key to being happy frankly in the simplest sense mm -hmm. yeah i'm um you know i have a a baba chakra right behind me in my office that I'm pointing to here at the center of the wheel of suffering. And, and yeah, the, I'm, I'm reminded that one of the, the titles of one of your articles or book chapter, I guess that students will be reading in the course uses this metaphor of waking into um, mm. compassion, I believe, as opposed to waking from. Um, and that when one cultivates compassion, one awakens into this world of beauty and Yes, it's, it's illusory. Things are not necessarily what they seem, but you have this kind of agency where if it's just happening to you, you're in that dream and you're forever running and you'll never get away from whatever's chasing you. Mm -hmm. And that um, there's something very um, profound at the highest levels in that as well. Um, in Advaita Vedanta, for instance, in, in many yogic tradition, actually, uh, the idea is to utterly eclipse the, uh, the activity of the mind, what uh, Tibetans might call the display or something. And later in tantric traditions, they actually even will valorize that as the dance of the goddess. Um, but what I mean to uh, emphasize is that um, when you wake into an illusion, it's like waking into a dream and being in a lucid dream versus waking up from a dream and the dream disappears. So the, the attitude towards the world as illusory is really very different in Buddhism. Um, if the world is but a dream or like a dream, it's always important that Sanskrit word iva, you, know, you very often hear people say that the world is just a dream. It is like a dream in Buddhism. Um, it's the only dream we've got. And its presentation is our very lives. Um, so um, there's a fundamental difference between waking into an illusion, which you can still be engaged with and be at play with, but not be overcome by, in the same way that when you wake into a dream, you are no longer captured by the dream, but you can actually play in the dream. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another sort of similar metaphor that I like, and I'll, I'll use when talking about this with students is, um, you've got a, a leader 
of a caravan in the desert. And if it's an inexperienced leader, they're going to see, the whole group will see a um, oasis um, and they'll run towards it and they'll think, oh boy, it's water. Um, but in fact, it is a mirage and, and they will be disappointed. But then you have perhaps a caravan leader who has polarized lenses on their sunglasses and who, leading the group, no longer sees this mirage, sees it for what it sort of is, which is sand, um, but their whole group sees this oasis mirage and wants to run towards it, and the leader of the caravan just says, well, there's no oasis there, I'd... and and has no idea how to relate to the group of people who sees this mirage. But then you have the really experienced caravan leader who travels and sees the mirage, but knows that it's a mirage, and is able to kind of understand why the, the group that they're traveling with sees it as an oasis, um, and is able to lead them skillfully, but doesn't necessarily erase the image of the oasis. They see the oasis, but they see it as a mirage. And so being able to see things both ways is something that emerges from deep experience, and it's also going to be the best kind of caravan leader. Yes, the, one of the most common metaphors in all Buddhist texts is of a magician mm -hmm. who can produce uh, an illusion of a thundering herd of elephants or whatever, a tiger floating in the sky. And that the, the thing is that the, the magician sees the image as well, but they see through it at the same time. Yeah, I always think of the first time they showed motion pictures to people. They did things like had trains fly right out of the screen and audiences actually ran screaming out of the theaters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Um, you know, a jump scare in a horror movie, that'll still get me. Um, but yeah, I'm reminded, though, of, you know, I think in that same Waking into Compassion article, um, you use this in reference to this, again, this problem of, well, how do you have compassion for a selfless beings. Um, so like, what is that, or how is that sort of set of examples useful in that particular case? Um, so, and I know this is sort of a complicated question because you explain all this in the whole um, article, but in a certain way, like, We've got our uncritical version of beings as, you know, just sentient beings that exist, and we have compassion for them. But then you have kind of this more highly philosophical view of, well, oh, those are selfless beings. It's just the play of dharmas. There's not actually any sort of being there to be compassionate for. And the mistake that we were talking about earlier of just falling into nihilism is then to say, oh, well, there's no reason I have to be compassionate then because there's, there's no one there. Um, but the ability to see kind of both um, the sentient being, even as you sort of could undertake this philosophical analysis that sort of deconstructs them, um, means that there's always going to be this being for whom compassion is warranted. Yes. So my pause is because you know, it's the kind of a question that you, you would want to take a really deep breath and then yep. <laughs> think very carefully about how you want to respond. Um, a very simple answer is that generally speaking in Buddhist thought, they make a distinction between conventional and ultimate truth. Mm -hmm. And in terms of conventional truth, um, there are sentient beings. Ultimately, when we talk about uh, selflessness or, or um, emptiness, depending on which tradition we're in and how they interpret those things, there are no sentient beings. There's no anything else either. So the analogy that I often make is between, in physics, that in modern physics as well, ultimately, when you look at the level of atomic structures or quarks or this ever sort of more esoteric um, levels of reality that dissolve things down into at this point, there are no sentient beings. Mm 
there's no level at which you can now that's a radically liberative idea it's a powerful idea you can do things like make atomic bombs with it it's such a powerful idea it completely changes the way you conceptualize physical objects and gives you powers and freedom that might address suffering but it's not the level in which you find ethics um, so but on the level of conventional truth you can use that power and you can use that vision in ways that are uh, liberative and uh, compassionate, um, but uh, it and no, by no means uh, does it just simply dispel conventional reality. Mm -hmm. um, as uh, Professor Eckel, who was another one of my teachers at Harvard, used to say, the conventional doesn't go away. Um, Robert Thurman had this. Uh, he came to Harvard too while we were there. Um, he liked to talk about uh, a cognitive double exposure where you simultaneously see the conventional and the ultimate. And that's about, this is this idea of waking into illusion. When the magician sees through the illusion, the illusion doesn't disappear. He still sees the illusion. He still sees the world as such, but he also knows its, its substructure. He knows the psychology and how it's produced. And that gives him power and he doesn't react to it the same way as other people. Um, so those are completely different kinds of responses. From a perspective of, say, Advaita Vedanta, the illusion utterly disappears. You wake from the illusion. There is no more world. It was merely an illusion in the first place. You transcend it permanently and completely. So there's a, a very radical choice being made in that idea of waking into an illusion it doesn't dispel the world mm -hmm. yeah and that beings continue to exist and, and importantly their suffering continues to exist yeah sure does <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's plain as day isn't it yeah yeah and that um again goes back to this idea that you've mentioned that um sort of the first thing on the path often um you know well maybe after you know Practicing the Dharma is good for you. It's going to get you lots of nice things. Compassion is good. Do all these things. But um, is also an awareness of suffering, right? And training in compassion is always going to be, have to do at least something with an awareness of that suffering and a desire to relieve it. And that part of the reason that that's so foregrounded is that it does, um, it, it continues to need to orient people even as kind of more complex analyses of reality are added. Yeah, one of the really fascinating things that uh, I don't know if anyone has really explored at this point is that, um, you know, we're going to look at one of my pieces where it talks about a philosopher named Prajna Karamati's uh, commentary on uh, Bodhicharya Avatar of Shantideva, where he systematically goes through these perspectives. And when he comes down to uh, the fact that he actually affirms conventional reality, despite the fact that on some level it's illusory, he says that it, how do you discern what is correct conventional reality or not? And if ultimately it's illusory, how do you make any kind of meaningful distinction there, right? It's a good question. And he says some types of conventional truth relieve suffering and some types of conventional truth don't. So it's almost like, uh, a compassionate perspective on suffering and what relieves it has epistemological power. And this is just one of the reasons I think that, uh, you know, people you might think that taking a compassion class is sort of a, a sort of a side issue or something like that. When you see how they treat these problems, you understand emptiness in a different way. You understand the problem between or the distinction between conventional and ultimate truth in a different way. Um, so compassion um, is actually a window into some of the most profound issues in, in Buddhist philosophy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this this actually comes up in my own work on pilgrimage insofar as uh, the Tibetan pilgrimage tradition will make the claim that you're going to see this holy mountain. Mountain is actually a mandala, a palace for this divine being. And if only you could learn to see it um, as it truly is, uh, then you would see that. But most people don't see that, they just see a pile of rocks and snow. And so the, the goal is to learn to see it better. Um, and you know this pilgrimage tradition is very popular and important. But then um, it kicks off this whole debate because people say, 
well, actually, does the mountain exist ultimately at all? You know, when we're talking about the mountain as it truly is, when we're talking about ideas of reality, um, shouldn't the mountain sort of dissolve under analysis? And they make recourse to the same idea. They say, well, there's multiple versions of conventional reality, and some are better than others. Yes. And so actually every vision of the mountain um, are conventional visions, but some of them are going to be um, conducive towards enlightenment. And they also say, well, in the realm of conventional reality, that's where you know karma and blessings can kind of exist. And so, yeah, pilgrimage is conventional all the way down, but conventional reality really matters. And if you yeah, skip so over to ultimate reality and leave behind conventional reality, you'll, you, you're missing the point in many ways. And, and that sounds very fanciful and like magical thinking, you know, the mountain is a sort of a palace of the deity or something like that. But, um, um, wow, this is probably a, a place where I won't be able to get to with this much space in a small course, but um, all worlds are imaginatively constructed worlds. You can go to the border between the United States and Canada and stick your foot in, you know, homeland America and then across the, some stick or something or some grass into Canada. And there's literally no difference whatsoever in terms of conventional reality. So if you want to commit an apocalypse to destroy a world, all you have to do is destroy the Tibetan imagination to destroy Tibet. The Chinese uh, communists are well aware of that. Just prohibit the language undermine the culture, make all education have to be in Chinese. You literally destroy a world. Similar thing with the Native American cultures in the United States. We took people, we took their language away, their dance away, their song away, their stories away. When you do that, you literally destroy a world. So there's actually a profound sophistication in this idea where the Tibetans on that pilgrimage are in a more sophisticated way, seeing how we actually participate in constructing an imaginal world. And it took many, many centuries to develop collectively the imaginal construction that is Tibet. Tibet's not mountains and rivers. Tibet is an imaginal topography that is projected on the landscape or is implicit and necessarily part of the way we experience reality. So in a sense, that is the real world that we inhabit. And when, and this does come back to compassion, when we realize the incredible power we have to inhabit a world and have it be completely compelling, you know, or to, to imagine ourselves in a way that's so completely compelling and false and produces so much suffering. And um, this, the flip side of that, and this is about waking into an illusion instead of waking from it as well, is that you recognize the sheer power of imagination in the first place. It means that we actually have the creative power to create pure lands, to create another type of world. And it all is implicit in our imaginations. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what makes, you know, good conventional, good conventional, or um, what makes a compassionate teaching is in effect a true teaching. Mm -hmm. How do we dream a different kind of world? Mm -hmm. And what are the collective results of different kinds of dreaming, right? Different kinds of uh, imaginative constructions of ourselves in community with others. Yes. Yes. Um, Karin Myers just held an NHS seminar on Buddhism and imaginal worlds. Um, mm. She taught BSO uh, 103 Indian Buddhist philosophy. And um, I was, you know, I'm really excited to see all the work that's going to come out of that. Because I think, yeah, this, this question of the imagination, right? Again, it seems so fanciful, right? Imagination is something that like kids play around with, but actually, um, you know, this is so shot through all of Buddhist thought is that um, we participate in the construction of our own worlds, um, yes. and between get us and our actions to... and the things that we see is is so much mental construction, for better or for worse. I often get students to think back to what it was like to be in seventh or eighth grade and the mental image that they had of themselves at that time, how painful that was, how completely compelling it was. And that if you could go back now and talk to that child, um, how would you, how would you help them visualize themselves out of that, um, projection. But what it shows there also is that we're already incredible visualizers. 
So, you know, we're capable of visualizing a completely delusional world, a completely delusional identity. Um, and that also implicitly suggests that we're capable of visualizing a completely different kind of identity and a completely different kind of world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's actually a really good opportunity for a transition point to, to, to go back to our little pin um, in terms of, you know, how this works in you know, our world, which is so imperfect and so full of harm and so full of uh, difficult things that... Um, you know, we, we can speak to the ability uh, to, to create a new world or to, to learn to cooperatively construct a world that is less conducive to suffering. And so, you know, that's all informing this question um, of like, what does compassion have to say about how we live in this imperfect world that is full of harms? Um, like, I think the sort of standard opinion on the street is maybe, you know, okay, Buddhists are all nonviolent, you know, so does compassion necessarily imply a stance of nonviolence? Um, or, um, you know, how do you think about these kinds of things? Well, first of all, that's a really a tricky question for us. It's another place where we have to think about the processes of uh, world engagement, you know, the, similar to the pizza effect. Um, the, the discourse of, of uh, violence versus nonviolence um, is a distorting discourse in terms of mm -hmm. Buddhist thought. Um, it's rooted in Gandhianism. And fascinatingly, Gandhi's nonviolence comes from Tolstoy and Thoreau, from our world, not from Indian thought. So this British trained lawyer brings that kind of thinking into India and made it an incredibly successful uh, social movement out of it. And then the irony, though, is that Martin Luther King, being under the influence of Gandhi, thinks he's actually under Asian influence or the influence of Indian religions in terms of promoting nonviolent resistance as well. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of confusion there. One of the roots is that the term ahimsa, mm -hmm. which is generally translated as nonviolence, never meant what Westerners mean by nonviolence in Hindu texts or Jain texts or Buddhist texts. It means non-harm, mm -hmm. and that's a very much more tricky term. Um, His Holiness the Dalai Lama likes to emphasize that um, there are certain kinds of things that uh, may be violent, but they're not harmful. And there are certain kinds of things that are not violent, but are harmful. And he actually uses that uh, to give him the leverage to talk about uh, institutionalized and economic kinds of oppression and exploitation as what he would say are actually properly described as violence, but in the terms of ahimsa. So he continues to use in the violence, nonviolence binary because it has such a sort of a strong uh, iconic connection to it, that ideal. But the uh, uh, the Dalai Lama, uh, for instance, um, at first uh, shocked people by supporting uh, the, uh, the death of Osama bin Laden. When he was asked about the Gulf Wars, he said he wasn't sure yet if they were good wars. This is a person who supported a CIA insurgency in Tibet that was a, a basically a violent terrorist um, insurgency in, against the communists during the Korean War. And he still celebrates those people in Dharamsala. I've been there when he has. So it's much more complex. The Buddhist tradition is anti-harm and it's anti-hatred and anti-anger in all forms. But it also makes room for the fact um, that sometimes the least harmful thing actually requires force. And a basic, simple metaphor for this, just to get the concept, is a child's finger has been bitten by a poisonous snake. It's an example used both in uh, Buddhism and Jainism. So you chop that finger off to, to make the spread of the poison stop. But the, uh, so that's an, an extremely violent act. And if somebody doing it with different intentions or under other conditions would consider it a horrible crime. So it's the action, no action in itself is, um, uh, is inherently harmful. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I spent a lot of time uh, researching texts in, uh, in Sarnat at the, uh, at the Tibetan college there uh, under Geshe Samten. And later on gave a talk at the IABS, was just driving, talking about compassionate warfare, compassionate, even torture. I'm sorry, but there are things that would really shock moderners. Um, they, almost all Buddhist uh, polities in the world have had the death penalty and had Byzantine horrific uh, penal codes involving, you know, gouging out people's eyes, amputating, including Tibet. So how do we, how do we reconcile this? And there is actually a way, there's a, there's a, this is about um, distinguishing between harm and violence. Um, but at the end of the talk, Geshe Samtin came up to me and said, this is not violence. Because violence to him meant something that's unwarranted, something that's immoral. Um, he would even say that compassionate killing and the, the classic example is somebody's on a plane or on a vehicle. They're about to kill all the passengers. Uh, you're the pilot. You have no other options. What do you do? So uh, the uh, Paya Kausha, the skillful means sutra, the pilot, which is the Buddha in a past life, stabs to death this, uh, well, what we would call a terrorist today. And he saves the terrorists from the hell realms because he prevents them from committing this murder mm -hmm. of 300 people. He saves all the passengers, both from being murdered and from rioting and killing the, um, the terrorist if he tells them. So, and he himself makes massive amounts of positive merit because he's actually willing to risk the horrific karma of murder in order to prevent other people from receiving it in effect. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the ideals here are actually very, very complex. And you stop looking at Buddhist history, whether it's all the warfare between Buddhist polities across Southeast Asia or in uh, China and Japan, you know, warrior monks, et cetera, as if there's some sort of freakish um, uh, inconsistencies with uh, actual textually established Buddhist dogma and values. Um, in fact, it's far more complex than that. All cultures fail to live up to their highest ideals and do have shocking failures. Um, but on the other hand, um, Buddhism has much more complex, subtle, and nuanced values in how you deal with a school shooter situation, how you deal with a terrorist situation than we generally give them credit for. And I would actually say here, I and mean, I know this is generally these ideas can be shocking and disturbing to Buddhists committed to absolute nonviolence, that the Western bias here, and this is another case of the pizza effect, basically colonized peoples responding to the West with a, uh, an ideal of apparent pacifism that puts them on the moral high ground above their exploiters. Um, but when we owned that idea and we started presenting it as Buddhist values, it so impacted places like Sri Lanka that when I went there to do research on these issues, stories of the Buddha as a defense minister who defends his city in a siege and lures the enemy into a moat so that they can be uh, killed by a hail of weapons and crocodiles in the moat, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. They would consistently tell me no such Jataka tale exists. They didn't even know their own texts. And what that meant was, and in my opinion, this is a bit speculative. I'm not a profound expert on Sri Lankan culture, but I, I suspect, or I, 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 can, I have a concern that act, that is part of the reason that at the end of that civil war in Sri Lanka, there was a massive massacre of civilians because they didn't have any mediating sense of what the values of Buddhists are in warfare. How do you, conduct this type of struggle from a Buddhist perspective. And they were simply being told that it's absolute pacifism and there wasn't really any. Uh, and in fact, the Buddhist texts have very rich resources about how do you treat prisoners? How do you treat the environment? How do you treat infrastructure? Um, uh, how do you uh, actually conduct yourself in the course of a battle? Um, 
that have just simply been eclipsed and ignored because of the power of this preconception that Buddhists are simply pacifists. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, sometimes I liken it to, you know, we, we all sort of come in with our own preconceived notions that's sort of inevitable, um, but we have to be aware that it kind of puts blinders on us such mm -hmm. that we're not able to see things that are there. And so, interestingly enough, like, yeah, you know, those kinds of texts are often not the ones taught in courses. Um, and yet, um, you can see that there is actually a rich sort of consideration of how you operate in an imperfect world, how compassion will lead you to kind of live with it for others. That, you know, if you've got your blinders on and you want to see it as super sort of simple, um, and you're not making this interesting distinction between violence and harm, um, you're taking this rich idea and making it kind of simple, which almost to me connects to this idea that's underlying a lot of what we've said, which is that people think of compassion as not very interesting. It's kind of not a subject of Buddhist philosophy. You can talk about all these abstract ideas, but compassion is just compassion. You know, you care about the suffering of others. Um, and, and perhaps some of that is the fact that we've not been allowed to, or we're not allowing ourselves to see the complexity of this idea as it is discussed in a lot of Buddhist sources. Yeah, and in general, Buddhist studies is moving a lot more towards a rich consideration of narrative literature as being foundational for understanding the tradition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yes, Buddhist stories, um, you know, um, I forget which, there's a philosopher of psychology that, that makes this distinction. There's sort of narrative thinking, and then there's kind of systematic thinking, which tends to be more sort of like third person and abstract. Uh, but narrative thinking connects things in a different way that is actually really, really interesting and challenging, and it can exi exist in tension with kind of abstract third person philosophizing. Yeah, there's, it's, there's an interesting distinction, I think, between East and West here, to use those that rather horribly clumsy distinction mm -hmm. um, that in the West, especially because we were a biblical people, um, there's this tendency to try to extract, extract systematic thought principles from narrative. So the Bible is your basic text. And then, and then the philosophical tradition tried to just sort of extract and have a discourse sheerly rooted in uh, systematic thought alone, as if, you know, language could be used in a mathematically correct way that would give you the truth. But in Indian thought, especially in Buddhist thought, when they try to explain a principle, they give you a whole boatload of questions. And this is, of course, one of the, the uh, very strong teachings of our common mentor, uh, Charlie Hallisey. He would emphasize that, you know, the entire Jataka collection is considered mostly commentary. Um, or that you'll have someone ask a question, uh, for instance, when Chandrakirti uh, has to explain how you could have compassionate killing, uh, he responds with a whole long list of Kasich study examples. He doesn't say, you know, this is how the math works out. He actually roots you in context in the rich sort of thick description of life situations um, to sort of uh, engage us on that level in another type of thinking process than simple systematic analysis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that the question of, you know, is action X harmful or not? Well, to answer that question, you need more context. You need to broaden your lens. You need to think about it um, often with a story. And, and not just a story, but a story told to a particular person at a particular time who is in their own context. And so all of these kind of contexts just multiply out. Um, in a way that makes it difficult to just, you know, make a blanket statement about anything. Yes. And in fact, whenever somebody, the Buddha hears somebody say, that person's going to hell for this action or something, the immediate response is that karma isn't fantastically complex. I mean, this is actually the entire, it's the way Buddhists actually conceive our being in the world as sort of a, we're a nexus of an, an almost inconceivably complex uh, mass of causes and conditions that shape this moment that we arise in and sit here and that you're all listening to this podcast and at this moment. Um, and that only a Buddha could actually even see that. So 
Mm -hmm. it mitigates against judgment and anger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's a really, I think, um, lovely place to end with maybe the, the brief adding that, you know, when you're sitting in this complex web that is so complex that only a Buddha can understand it, uh, compassion is one of those things that can ground you yes. um, <laughs> instead of feeling lost, like, you know, amongst all of that. That is a, I think that's a beautiful way to end. Yeah. Yeah. And for um, all the difficulty of it. Um, and I try to test people's understanding and uh, sometimes the things I say are a little bit shocking and disturbing. Um, I just couldn't emphasize in the end that um, uh, it, there's, uh, I'm actually a scholar practitioner and see this as the most precious value in the world. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that um, you know is not a matter of simply abstract philosophizing. Well, hopefully um, everyone listening to this can go out and cultivate compassion for themselves or at least read some of these Buddhist texts des describing this, um, you know, super important and yet, as I think we've alluded to, often misunderstood ideal. And um, I'll just end by saying thank you to Dr. Stephen Jenkins for talking with us. Um, I'm really pleased to have this opportunity. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you.